teaching the life of the teaching staff member or focusing on student administration issues. It's really about student learning, so it's only one particular dimension uh, that I'll be talking about. Um, if you want to Twitter while we're going, that's fine if you use that hashtag mlearnbase. Um, at the moment we would like mobile phones on silent or vibrate if possible. Um, and I don't know if there's other matters, probably not. So this, this is really the topic, and I'm going to stand in a way, but I see there's another slide uh, on that side. Um, yeah, my own background is that I, I grew up in Belleville, so I know this place pretty well, and uh, uh, left for New Zealand. I was an academic there, I was in the IT industry, and at Massey University I was an academic in, in IT, and then later in adult education. In 95, I started the e-learning uh, initiative at the university, and I used that to write up my doctorate and finish that in 2000, so that, not that long ago. And it was about e-learning and the management of e-learning in tertiary education. Um, now, at, at CSU, and I'll share in a moment where we are, Charles Sturt University, uh, with the big, biggest distance education university, we've got th 33,000 students and 70% of those we never see on campus. So we've got to use technologies, whether it's paper or online, uh, and blend that together. We've got a very strong focus on blended and flexible learning. We don't, uh, we're not proponents of putting everything online or putting everything for mobile. We believe that the academic has that choice to uh, blend the technologies to create great learning experiences. Uh, and that's what we're on about. Uh, it fits within uh, a dashboard I've created and that I update every month or second month, um, which is available online. And what I'll do afterwards, I'll send somebody the link. I want to, I'll put this sh uh, the sh uh, slides on slide share, uh, and I'll also send a few links so that it can be circulated among uh, people who's interested. But that just shows you within our online learning environment a number of initiatives and technologies, and one of them is mobile learning. And there's also a number of supporting technologies there. Uh, and again, emphasizing that uh, it's about blended and flexible learning. This is an analysis that was done by a colleague of mine, Janet Buchan, 
Uh, and she looked back from 1998, what happened in terms of the technologies that the university had for learning and teaching. And initially we had forums and online submission of assignments and an online test quiz. And over the last few years, since 2008, you can see a number of technologies that was added. And not the least of which was our online learning management system. We use Sakai, uh, which is an open source LMS. So there's been a massive growth. And, and that calls for, a, creates a lot of issues about support, uh, about um, the blending of things, about the readiness of students to be able to access the things online or through mobile devices. Uh, lots of policy issues um, in the dashboard, uh, what I forgot to say was top right hand corner is about all those external systems now, all the Web2 technologies that's just exploding as you know, Twitter, Facebook, Ning, etc, uh, etc, et Second Life and so on. And we actually, before, a year ago, uh, people were very scared about those technologies and what, will, what it will do. Then we developed an educational technology framework, and that's also online, and I can point you to that. Um, and where we actually encourage our academics now to use those technologies. We're still building the policies and principles around it, uh, but it's not going to go away. And it's not, it can't all be integrated into an LMS. Um, but we've got to use, uh, choose carefully, and there are ethical issues about it, and privacy issues, and all kinds of issues. So it's not making it easier, it's making it more complex. But it won't go away now, academics in any case use it. We've got 750 academics, and people are doing fantastic work. One thing about a community or practice that we're building over the last few years um, around ICT-enabled learning or e-learning, uh, we use a tool called yammer.com and it's a, it's a free uh, uh, tool, microblogging tool, where people sign in and, and it's a closed uh, network. It's like Twitter, but it's closed to the university staff. And what we find is people telling each other about great things they find and they see. Uh, and it's quite a lively community in the university. We also run every month or second month, we run something similar than like this. And we have academics talking, uh, sharing with their colleagues about specific topics. Uh, and we found that good because we've got five campuses all over New South Wales. And people don't see each other that often. We do teleconferencing and video conferencing every day of our lives. Uh, as our, like our students have to do. Um, so we practice what we preach in that way, but that brings the community together around specific topics. So we're building that community. So I think the synopsis was in any case circulated about the seminar today and what I'm going to talk about. And it does remind me of the joke about the two dogs who were serving, surfing the web and the one dog turned to the other dog and said, you know what I like about the web? Nobody knows you're a dog. And um, we've just really started with mobile learning. And I'll tell you in a minute. And I'm visiting seven universities in South Africa to learn what they're doing and to share what a little bit we're doing uh, with them. But really we've only started. So. I'm relying a lot on our investigation we did last year on mobile learning uh, and what I found in the literature and what I found at conferences and so forth. So I'm definitely not the expert on, on this area at all. I'm a beginner learner. So there are six areas that, that I've identified where mobile learning could help the learner. One is about accessing learning materials in a more flexible way, accessing learner support, performing learning tasks, uh, participating in learning interactions, uh, uh, performing assessment tasks, both formative and summative, and then evaluating teaching. And then as I worked through this in my preparation, you know, the issues also from the literature just started emerging about ethical issues, educational, technical, and so forth. So these six areas are not watertight. They overlap. 
I'm not trying to say they all fit nicely, mm -hmm. but it helps us just as a framework for discussion. Oh yeah, and I wanted to say, after each of those six, um, I'll, I'll stop and say, okay, let's discuss and, and any ideas or comments or questions or whatever. So this is a seminar, it's not a lecture. So I'm going to stop every, every now and again and uh, open up for questions. We'll skip that one, we don't have time for, for that, unfortunately. Uh, I think I already mentioned that. Okay. A colleague of mine that reported to me just when he returned a week ago from the States where he visited uh, Abilene Christian University as well as Oklahoma State University. Abilene Christian University is probably the world leaders in mobile learning. They've just given all their first year students an iPad. And two years ago they gave them all an iPod. And that's just how they do things. And there's a whole spirit, a whole culture of innovation in that university. And it's not just about giving the technologies out. They run training sessions on a daily basis uh, for all, everybody on all the things that, that need. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of resources tied into that professional development and training. But he found very interesting things. And some of that I'm mixing in here. Um, there's, do you know about the uh, Horizon report that comes out every year and they look at the technologies for the next uh, one year, three years and five years I think. And for the last three years, and, and what they're looking at is technologies in learning that's going to be critical. So what's on the Horizon? And mobile learning has been number one for the last three years. And it's just exploding in South, Af South Africa, in Australia. The uh, directors of, of uh, IT comes together and every year uh, identify the top ones that they need to support. And mobile learning was nowhere for the last three years. And it jumped to number one just this year uh, above everything else. So there's a huge international interest in mobile learning and we'll talk about why. Um, you know that mobile devices become more common. Um, there's a lot more uh, operating systems coming up. Um, it's not just the iPad, it's Android and Microsoft has Windows Mobile, so forth. So the big companies are looking at this also with a lot of interest. And smartphones these days, you know, have the data capacity and all kinds of things, the video and the, the photo and so forth. So Mobiles are coming today, the devices are becoming cheaper and yet they're becoming more powerful. So that enables us to do more with them for learning and teaching as well. Um, I'll just quote there Steve Jobs in April, just in March this year, announced that um, Apple has, for the first time, I think, uh, no, that, that's another quote. Um, where is that one about? Uh, selling more desk, selling more um, I, uh, iPhones than desktops for the first time in the history. So, you know, it's just exploding in terms of numbers. Uh, we're probably coming a little later. Oh, there we go. Smartphones are sold pieces for the first time uh, in 2010. Okay, so what have we done at Charles Sturt University? And Charles Sturt, by the way, was an explorer and had a very good relationship with the indigenous people. So uh, we're quite proud to have the university named after somebody like that. Um, so we did a survey, and we're doing a survey now every two years, and we survey all our teaching staff and, and uh, students. And 80% of, 87% of our students indicated that they wanted to revisit work from lectures on their handheld mobile device. That's huge. Uh, and it's not happening at the moment, but we've got the mandate to do that. Um, but they were half and half on whether they want a campus information or subject information or their readings. And that was interesting because, uh, because we've got 70% of our students distance education, they get all their readings printed from the textbooks and get sent in a block. Uh, and they enjoy the block, that's clear. Uh, but that was done three months after the iPad came out. Now with an iPad, 
uh, or any uh, uh, of those devices, you can read much easier. So I'm very interested to see in a year's time when we do the survey again, what changes have happened there. And there's a few other bits and pieces as well. So we did an investigation last year, and we came up of a number of areas that we're going to address. And those are the ones, mobile interact, and that means that's our LMS, that's going to be totally mobilized. Um, we're going to buy a lot of devices and hand it out to staff and students and let them explore different ways of capturing things and getting it back into the LMS and, and supporting their learning. Uh, then the learning materials, not the readings, but the, what we call the study guides, that's going to be uh, available in mobile uh, formats. And then, uh, at the end of every session, every one of our subjects, and I think you call them modules, get uh, assessed by the students, both the academic and the teaching, uh, the teaching, sorry, and the environment gets assessed by the students. That goes to the academic and to the head of school. Nobody else see that. But the fact is that we they always did it on paper. Now they're doing it online. And we saw a huge drop in, in response uh, because they don't sit in a room and they have to do it in the room. So we, we're going to make that available on mobile phones as well. So wherever they are, they can much easier respond. In any case, that's, that's our priorities there. At the moment, at m.csu.edu.au, they can get bus time, tables, context, library, maps, opening hours. So very, very basic stuff they can get on, on mobile phone through a mobile web. And they're building a mobile app as well to have campus maps and, and things like that. But that's not what I'm talking about. It's, it's about learning and teaching. I've used the term mobile learning uh, all the time, and yet if you go to the literature, there are hundreds of definitions that people have started to talk about. What is a mobile device? I mean, an iPad is just a tablet. It's just, it's, it's nearly just a, a laptop without a screen. Or it's a screen of a laptop with a computer behind it. So, you know, what is a mobile device? And so we came up with, with a definition about what mobile learning means, but it's essentially anything you can carry in your hands comfortably. And even that is, is obviously a very vague definition. But um, it is not easy to know what is a mobile device anymore. Because you get your notebooks, you know, which is just like a tablet with a screen. And what I did with my iPad, I bought a little Bluetooth uh, keyboard. And so now I have got a netbook in a way. And so uh, the fact is it's all blending. And I know that some people say it's actually a nuisance, this whole mobile learning story, because uh, you can carry a laptop around and so forth as well. But I find my iPad has three times the battery life. It opens immediately. There's no startup going through Windows or Apple or whatever. You know, it's immediate. It's there. Um, it's got all the apps that's being developed in the world, also for Android or Android uh, devices. So in any case, it's exploding. And um, so let's talk about the first one. Students accessing learning materials. Um, now, instead of having a bulleted list of, you know, these are the things you can do for, for students to access learning materials, we described it in personas. So we made little stories uh, of some real-life students and some makeup students from the literature. So I'm going to read, no, I'm not going to read because then I can rest a little bit. Can you read that first one, please? Kevin looks like age 20. He's a student stuck in public transport in a regional location. While waiting to get, his, to get home, he used his mobile device to download information regarding the subject, including the subject study guide. He, he is then able to make use of this time to read through the content. <clears throat> so that's one example. Stuck in the traffic, reading through the content. Okay, so can we have Martha here? Martha Cooney is a study of my On this day, she is able to browse with some resources in an online store on her iPad. Before she reaches the destination, she has given a few samples and chose to purchase an e-book of her prescribed text. So 
So I saw a nice graphic, I should have grabbed it. Um, but it shows sort of all the books and how books in the library uh, over the years in sort of maybe thousands of volumes sort of went up and then on top. It's just the iPad. <laughs> so, and that's what we're talking about there. You know, the ease of just moving things around. And I experienced that once on a trip, on a train trip. And I had the iPad with me and I had the time. And I opened it quickly and there was a report from a colleague of mine that she wanted to submit at a conference or something to do with a conference and I was able to read it there and it's a big report. And so it's just uh, the compactness of what we have there. And then there's Rachel about pod and vodcast and we're just putting in an Echo 3 a system that records lectures uh, and then make it available or you can record little snippets. And then uh, already in our LMS, the podcasting tool we have, uh, people can download onto their uh, mobile device as well. So this is all about accessing learning materials. That's what it's about. It's, it's more flexible. Um, and when I think about it, I always think, so why can't paper do that? You know, because we do work with a lot of paper for our students. And paper is very portable. And it's very flexible, and you can do a lot of good stuff with it. Uh, but you can't search with it. You know, you can't type in a search word and search through the whole document for you. And you can't do multimedia in and play a video on a page, you know, which you can do. Um, but then again, I start thinking, so well, how is it different than a laptop? The laptop can do all those things as well. So, you know, that would be sort of a line with people who say this is just nonsense. This is just about learning with other technologies. This is not really a big deal. Okay. In terms of accessing learning materials, do you have students perhaps, or can you think of other examples where people might use a mobile device to access learning materials? is making sure that nobody is disadvantaged in the process, making sure there are alternative access mechanisms. But the very, very interesting thing about mobile learning is that the, develop, the developing world is leading the developed world, with the exclusion of Abilene Christian University, around mobile learning. It's amazing what you can do on mobile devices, India, Africa, you know, for business purposes and all kinds of things. And it seems that the developing world has just leapfrogged straight to the cutting edge because mobile device reception is much wider than desktop reception, internet. And the, the uh, spread of mobile devices is much higher than desktops in the developing world. And so people have jumped straight to the mobile stuff and uh, is actually doing great things. But it has the issues with it. And not everybody has a smartphone. So one's got to know and think about alternatives all the time. Philip, mm. do you just emphasize on um, the access to discussion forum by the non-artists? So if you have an online course, you can give you some snippets of your announcements, snippets of your course. And if you, if you actually set up a discussion topic related to yeah. uh, specific tasks, you are able to access the discussion for and engage in it by the way. Sorry if that happens. So we need to still do uh, an impact to the advocacy. Okay, so your e-learning system can already, the students can access it with a mobile device in terms of learning materials, in terms of files that's there. 
yeah. okay. which is another point that I'm going to go to now. Okay, so the second thing that, that I can see and that we are aware of at the Charles Sturt University is students accessing learning support. Because it's not just study materials as we know, they need support as well. So, here's Patrick. Uh, can you be Patrick, please? Yes. <laughs> you can read that. Patrick, 37, is a post grad MBA student part time that works in the city with a 45 minute commute each way. During the commute, he remembers that one of his assi assessments is due next week, but can't remember the exact date. Using his smartphone, he logs into the the learning management system, checks his subject outline, and then marks it into his calendar with a reminder for the weekend. Okay, so what we call a subject outline is sort of the topics that's going to be taught, all the assessments that are due, when they are due, how to access the library. And so every subject or every module will have then the module outline or the syllabus. And so this person, Patrick, access that and, and could get that kind of support. Let's go to another one. Um, Robin, can you be Robin, please? Robin, 51, is a mature age student returning to study after 25 years in the workforce. She is struggling with the learning management system and with the DE materials that are so different from when she got her degree. Fortunately, she is able to access a range of resources and tools to help her including the interactive tutorials, so she is able to see how things work. She has to con contribute to a wiki in one of her subjects, and after watching a video showing how wiki formatting is done, she feels more confident. She has downloaded a cheat sheet to her mobile that lists all the codes so she can refer to it quickly whenever and wherever she needs to. So this is about a person that it's not about the learning as such, but how to use a specific tool, a wiki. And she could access that on her mobile and quickly run through it and get a few tips and then she's, she's ready to, to move on. Um, mobile device library is something that's already, I should have mentioned it, is already happening at our university where they actually load onto iPads a number of um, uh, sorry, in that case it was the Kindle, I think they do Kindles as well, where they download certain books and stuff on the iPad already for ready for the student. They come in, they pick up the Kindle, sign out for it, and uh, they then can use it with those, in, that information. So it's supporting information, not the actual learning information. Okay, a cheat sheet is like a, a, a summary of things you need to do. So it's like a cheat sheet, yeah, it's often not longer than one page. Like let's say you must end it a bit weekly, it'll we'll just have the, the key things there. Which made me think of a story I heard of a workshop somebody ran and everybody else was making, making lots of notes and then um, this one person just made one note and so he went to her afterwards and said, what did you write down there? She said, your telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very small cheat sheet. <laughs> okay, performing learning tasks. So that's, we've had uh, accessing learning materials, so that can be done more flexibly. Number two, we can access learning support through mobile devices. And number three is performing learning tasks. So this is where a lot of the real learning now happens. So how can mobile devices do that for us? So can you be uh, Andre for us, please? Uh, no, sitting. Oh, yep. okay. Andre, 42, is a fourth year education student on practicum in a small country town teaching year two children. He uses an iPad to access his learning management system modules and communicate with other students in the class using the chat tool. Okay. So now it's, it's, you've got the learning materials, learning support, but now it's a learning task you've got to do. Thanks. And so he's into the learning management system, like your learning management system, and can access actually modules there and starting to work through that. 
Now on an iPod, iPad, there's an app called docs to go and any Microsoft uh, uh, tool uh, you can use under that app. And you can highlight and you can scribble and you can do things. And there's another one, Good Reader, where you can take a PDF document and highlight and do those kind of things. And that's where you're starting to work with those materials. Then you can do it on mobile devices. So Liz, can you be Liz, please? Pad is the commercial name of the ePortfolio system we have. And students are, use the <coughs> ePortfolio system to build up their portfolio over their whole program or course. Um, I think do you call it course or program? <laughs> the modules make up a program. program. So over the whole program, they, from their first year, they build up and they've got to look for little artifacts and evidence that support what they claim that they can do. And so, with, and, and that's a system that's already available, I should have put that in too. Uh, PebblePad has an iPad application. They download on their iPad or iPhone, and then they can load up little bits of information straight into their portfolio. So this is really doing the learning bits. I'll just talk about the second one. Um, and this is where Mick sends x-rays from outstations with comments to the academic for uploading the LMS or sometimes uploading himself at the homestead. And this is somebody that's studying sort of a joint degree with health science as well. Uh, this actually um, I got from the eLearning Africa conference site where I'm going. Uh, and this is actually a, a doctor in Botswana. Uh, in an outlying area that, that's taking with his mobile phone, taking a photograph of the X-ray and send it to Khabarone and then uh, it's being analyzed there. So that the concept is somebody out in the field can take a quick picture or mobile uh, video or whatever and send it through. Um, now that's, I mean, compare that to a laptop now, you know, that you can't really do that. You really need a bit more mobile kind of a device to take a picture, a picture or a video and then send it in. So the fact is, more flexibility uh, for people. I'm sort of skipping a little bit through because of the time. Um, participating in learning interaction. So first was accessing to learning materials, accessing learning support. Um, learning tasks and now we're talking about learning interactions and that's why <coughs> when the forums come in that can be accessed through a mobile device now right here at your university and students can actually post something to the forum. <coughs> so that's a great example of participating in a learning interaction. Um, let's go to uh, George. Uh, can you be George, please? Oh, I feel young and beautiful now. <laughs> George 22 is on practicum for his nursing subject. He uses his mobile device to access the online forum to see how his peers are going and to share his experiences. During his rounds, he had to deal with a particularly difficult patient, and during his break posts, how we and his supervisor dealt with the situation. This stimulates a long thread of other students sharing stories and techniques that they have picked up. Other students are able to read these and feel more prepared if they are placed in similar circumstances. This supports authentic learning, meaningful learning tasks are related to immediate learning goals. Thank you. And that, uh, if you're in the educational field, you'll know that authentic learning is quite an important thing and people believe that, you know, that it needs to be as close as possible to real life in, in, for them. So it's contextualized. And this person is out there, practicum for nursing, 
uh, dealing with the patient and can quickly go up and post something on the forum about how they're dealing with that, get some discussion going, uh, and when they later get back maybe to the office or to the work or back on campus or whatever, there's a whole thread of discussion already that gone on about it. In the past it would be, you know, experience the thing, think about it, try to remember it, go back and then try to post something about it while it's right there, meaningful in the context and being used right there. So there are more examples, but I'll skip that. Going to number four, performing assessment tasks. Now I know that the University of Pretoria about five years ago were already sending SMSs out to some of their students in some sub uh, modules and uh, where the students could test their own knowledge on, on, on a mobile phone. And just with SMS, now the question then, which is one of the issues, is who's paying for those SMSs? And uh, are we moving the, the, shifting the cost to the student in some of these things? Someone's got to think about that. But um, we'll go to Sam, which is sitting just there. Thanks, Sam. Sam, 26, is a trainee parks manager. He's getting a Bachelor of Environmental Sciences. Sam is struggling to connect to anything because of his location, very remote. Sam struggles with a poor internet connection on his home state and is able to get mobile reception in some locations with higher elevation. Sam is able to take his tablet computer and submit his assessments using his mobile connection saving, connection saving a long trek into his town. Uh, mobile learning thus addresses geographical or spatial distance. Right. So that doesn't make sense with a little mobile phone to, or smartphone to submit a whole assignment. But if you have a tablet, you can finish it up there and then just submit it uh, using, if you use an iPad, the Safari browser or Internet Explorer or whatever the browser is you use, and then link to our university has that online system where people submit their assignments. And that system sends them a little email to say, yes, you have submitted it. Uh, at this time, and it also records whether it has been submitted. So no more of that dogs that ate the assignments and all those things. We <laughs> know exactly when it's been submitted. Okay, evaluating teaching is the last one, which is about, um, and that's what I said to you that we want to, we evaluate teaching on a very rigorous, uh, every every module, every session. Uh, students comment on it and uh, that gets fed back into the system. But the idea is, and I'm not going to, the first one of our classroom feedback is the one I talked about. So at the end of a session, students can, from wherever they are, on their mobile device, comment on the learning and teaching that took place, on the technologies used and so forth, and evaluate them. But the other one is interesting here of Don, and that's do any of you use clickers in the classroom or have other people use clickers? Yeah. Yep. So uh, it is being replaced in Australia with mobile phones uh, because there's a system that you can actually send to, you send a specific number if you say yes and another number if you say no. So you send an SMS to it. Uh, sorry, no, do you phone or send an SMS? Um, I think you actually phone the number, but it will just give you an engaged signal. It never picks up. But that engaged signal is enough to indicate whether it was this phone number or that phone number used. So there's no cost to nobody. Um, and so instead of using clicker devices, they're starting to use mobile phones and phoning those numbers. So that's an, an interesting development. So that's about assessing teaching. Okay, to close off with talking about issues. So already we've discussed some issues as we were going through. And I'm using that picture as sort of the interface between human and, and technology. Ethical ones is that one we talked about inequity and making sure that people that cannot, do not have a specific technology are not disadvantaged in any way. And so we've got to think of alternatives. The second one is radiation. Now, you'll never get on any of the big companies 
anything about radiation of mobile phones, but there are lots of reports out there that claims that there are issues with radiation and mobile devices. So we've got to be responsible and, and think carefully through this. Um, and maybe make sure that we have risk reduction strategies and make clear, clear to people, you know, instead of plugging that holding it next to the ear to use uh, headsets or earphones and, and so forth and so forth. But we've got to look at that one. Uh, then the other one is about um, mobile phones or mobile devices rather in classes. Now if I take my iPad in here and I take notes, that's perfectly fine. If I start going into my personal Facebook and I'm not at all concentrating on anything, I don't think that's fine anymore. Uh, if I sit there and the academic is talking and I'm searching the web and I'm checking and I'm getting some comments and stuff and putting my hand up and said, okay, you said this, I found this, what do you say about that? I think that's healthy. So where do we draw the line in terms of bringing things in? It's also uh, during assessment, I mean, this is what it looks like these days, isn't it? So when people write a test and they all go and put their mobile phone somewhere, because uh, it's very nice to text my buddy and find out what they actually think of that or call somebody at home. Uh, and, and getting some help to answer questions. Uh, educational issues. So what is the place in blended learning? Uh, where does it fit? Because it is such a great thing, you know, is, 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 it, is it sort of the, the laptop? Do we think of it as computer work or is it more personal work? That's maybe one thing I haven't mentioned and I don't know where to put it in yet, but what I'm picking up in the literature now is sort of a talk about it's a personal device. It's not so much the mobile, mobile element that gets emphasized, but it's a very personal thing. A laptop is still a pretty commercial thing, although I do my personal things there. But I mean, my mobile is my mobile, and, and uh, it's, it's sort of a very personal way of, of dealing with things in a learning context. Um, technical issues. I picked up that picture also from the e-learning Africa site where people are standing on chairs and so forth to get to the point where they can get the signal. Um, but it's actually amazing how, how widespread mobile access is in, in Africa and developing countries and environments around the world. Um, in Australia, we're putting in a national broadband network that's going to be absolute gigabyte that's uh, taking it to all the country, uh, all the uh, towns in the world, towns in the world, all the towns in uh, in Australia. But where will they start? In the big cities, you know. So it's always the regional areas that sort of gets a little bit left behind. Other thing is it a fad? You know, Gardner's hypercycle. It's a guy called Gardner, and he brings out reports on where technologies are and, and so forth. And this is his hypercycle. It normally starts with a technology trigger. So something can be done. So we make a mobile smartphone. And then there's a peak of inflated expectations. So we're going to change the world, you know. In the 60s, we were going to change the world with the 50s, you know, with educational video. And uh, no more teachers needed, we'll just use video. And trough of disillusionment. Okay, so we said mobile learning, we all talked about it, we all tried it, and so it didn't really work, did it? Slope of enlightenment, so what did we learn from that? And then the plateau of productivity. So he believed most technology sort of work in that. It's interesting to think where on the scale is mobile learning at the moment? Um, and because of the history of technologies and education, be careful what we claim. And we've got to understand it within educational change management, which is uh, another of my research interests. And you've got four things you can change in, in change management. People can change, tasks can change, organizational structure can change, or technology can change. And it's best when you've got all four uh, actively uh, working in a change process. So people, tasks, organizational structure, meaning things like duty outlines, structures of who reports to who, all those things, and technology then you get some real change going. 
a, a, a favorite quote of mine from Hoffer, in a time of drastic change, it is the learners who survive. The learned is those who think they know everything, find themselves fully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> so, the fact is, we've got to think about mobile learning. Um, and, we'll skip that, and then, Another favorite quote of mine is, the future is not some place we're going to, but one we are creating. The paths to it are not found, but made. And the activity of making them changes both the maker and the destination. So it's we that can change things. It's not a future that's there. The future doesn't exist until it exists, and we making that future. So, ownership, initiative, ingenuity is needed to ride the wave of change and be responsible in the way we do it. Thank you. Um, I was just wanting to ask um, a question around, uh, which really linked to staff development and around generational shifts. And how are you taking the staff along with you in relation to the changing technologies? Because I think the things are changing so fast, and I think that depending on your age and stage in life, you're more open to it or not. And, so, and, and that's only one dimension, there are lots of other dimensions. But how are you finding the generational spread, and how are you... Uh, uh, how are you supporting staff so that one doesn't get a them and us situation, which might be an age-related thing? Okay, good. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Uh, lots of answers in my head. Um, I'll start with the most recent, and that is at our university, we're moving away from a, what's here called a module-based approach to a program-based approach. So we are reviewing programs on a regular basis now. And part of that is mapping technologies to uh, teaching objectives. So per program. So it does not depend on the specific academic's age or liking or dislike or whatever. It's about the educational rationale for using technologies within a program. Because we want to have some consistency across a program as well. Otherwise, you have one that, because it's the champion, yes. use everything. Yeah. It, it's not a bad thing, but, and it creates some pressure on the others, but, I mean, it's better to think of a whole program and then the technologies that you, that's used there as a minimum, and then people can obviously use more or less. So, I think that's one way. The second is that in that EdTech survey we did last year, among 250 of our staff, Sorry, 250 of the 750 responded, and 4,000 of our 33,000 students responded. And what we found, and remember our students are from age 18 to about age 75. Um, and age was not a descriptor of difference, actually. Uh, we found people that in their 60s, they were using it as big time and with a positive attitude as an 18, 19 year old among our staff exactly the same. Um, that's that. The other one is about, because we were distant, we have got 22 instructional designers, which is fairly unique, I think, in the world. I haven't come across any university with that number. And that's because we were distant, academics had to be taught or to help to teach at a distance. Now, that's gone in a way, you know, academics sort of know how to do that and the colleagues and this peer work and so forth. So educational designers, as we call them, they sit within the school and they help academics on a just-in-time basis and also run workshops and things, but their focus is educational design. So if there's somebody that's not moving along, you know, they know about it because they're in the schools. They report centrally, but they sit within the, physically in the schools. Um, and so they pick up where there are needs and issues. And then the other one is this uh, survey that's being done at the end of every session in every module. 
that goes to the head of the school and that feeds back into performance management. So, you know, somebody's not moving along uh, and they have either good reasons or bad reasons or whatever. So there's a number of, I think, things that work towards moving that along. But in the survey we find that about 17% of academics were positive about new technologies. Is that and one seven or seven oh? One seven. Oh, okay. Meaning they always jump first. Oh, okay. The question was something like, do you use technologies when sort of most people are not using no, it yes. yet? Oh. And then second question was, do you use it when most people are already using it? And it was oh. about four or five areas. So we found that there's about a 30% to 40% people in the middle that sort of just, okay, but not really interested, but not negative either. And that's the, 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 the clump that my job is designed to, to help along. Uh, because the champions, they do it in any case. They don't need that, any support really. But it's the people in the middle that we want to help along. But again, within a blended model. So not just for the sake of technology. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's very interesting. Um, it's interesting to see that whether you've actually managed to fuse um, teaching and learning, it sounds like it, with educational technology, so they're not seen as separate things at all. Absolutely. But um, it's the pedagogical value yeah. that you're looking at all the time. Exactly. And secondly, um, it seems to me that if staff members and students had iPads, in the long run it might um, turn out to be cheaper because you wouldn't be using, for example, so much printing and paper. Mm. Um, and I just wondered, I mean, we need such rationales, you know, to be able to present it and to convince people. Mm. I just wondered if there were any such studies. Mm. About the cost, the yeah. real cost of yeah. that? I haven't come across that in terms of mobile learning, not yet. Uh, the studies I looked at was more about the, you know, how beneficial is it to learn it or not. And I mean, yeah. that's just coming out. Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen that cost reduction kind of studies, unfortunately. But I'll keep an eye out if yeah. you give me your email. Yeah. Because I wanted to link to you on LinkedIn and I couldn't because you, I need your email address. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, my question is on e-portfolios. When they submit them, is it on the learning management system? Okay. E, um, our e-portfolio system, Pebblepad, is a commercial system, yeah. and it's we just uh, we've just got a link between the two systems. We try to look at open source portfolio, which is an open source e-portfolio system, and that sort of was integrated with Sakai, but it didn't work well. We're very clumsy. And so it's it's separate, two separate systems. Unfortunately, I would like it to be more integrated. Yeah, because we expect that the ePortfolio it is a it's for life. So even if mm. they are not students on the campus okay. or registered students, they should be able to build on that ePortfolio. Yes, and uh, with PebblePad, what we liked about them was that uh, for the first year after they they finish studies at whatever university in the world. The next year, their subscription is free to Pebble Bank, so that they can continue with their portfolio. And then it's a very small amount, like $15 a year or something, to continue. But if they get a lot of numbers, that can be a big amount. So I think they've got a good um, costing model there. But I agree with you. And it also sits within the university's desire to keep in touch with the alumni and to build a strong link with the university. So it makes sense to, for universities to, to take that approach and even fund the students for maybe the next 10 or 15 years uh, to access that system. <coughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In relation to what you're talking about now, to the cluster issue, again, um, your students, there, all those quotes that you have from them, we're using a variety of technologies to yeah. access information, iPads and iPhones and various things. Is there any sort of baseline requirement for students to have some, some sort of mobile technology available if they register at the university? Does the university issue anything? Our mm -hmm. university is not issuing anything. 
but what we found in our survey there was like uh, 90 something percent of students already have a smartphone uh, or a smart device and that's Australia and so it is different so it would be interesting to survey your students and to know where they are where they sit at the moment and then sort of check it in a year and see what because we were amazed at the high percentages of people and that were keen to get certain things on those devices. You know, one makes assumptions, but there's actually a huge rapid growth going on out there. And, uh, you know, the old assumptions doesn't seem to work so easily. But there is an ethical issue here. It's literally putting things out to see if it's effective. As you said, all students must get to access that. Yes. And so yes. they would have to check it themselves that all their students can access any information they want to see yeah. that if it's the only source yeah. or to provide exactly. the information about alternative sources. Yeah. I mean, the other option, and we're thinking about that, is to, to, to link things around student choice. And uh, when people register, you know, they can indicate whether they want what kind of but I mean, it's not going to be just choose any bits and combine it, and it gets impossible to administer. But, you know, you've got subject readings, you've got a subject outline, you've got a study guide and maybe additional material. So would you like to receive this on paper, this on online, this mobile, or some combinations? But we're thinking of that, to put it back in the hands of the student. <coughs> but it makes the production system more complex. Yeah. I'm going to comment and I think that, I think in our local context, I think we are heading towards in our country a system where we're going to be getting something like you've got this broadband network. We are busy driving towards our country being um, saturated with at least 10 gigabit <laughs> type speeds across university campuses. I just wonder whether or not some of our um, efforts also has been plugged in to prepare both lecturers and students mm -hmm. to get to that point where we have this kind of speeds. Mm -hmm. So we speak about, the mo about these mobile devices and stuff. But how do we get lecturers and learners to start using existing technologies? So the Wikipedia type stuff, how do we drive that in a positive settings? Or how do we encourage lecturers to do the podcast and those things? So that when we actually have the facility to go with the mobile devices, the iPads, that becomes second nature because as soon as people are comfortable with technologies, it doesn't matter what the cost is, people are going to push for it. But to get that mindset over, and I wonder how we go as a country to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So that's not the title you would just no. do more comments. No, I wouldn't want to answer that question. <laughs> All I would say is that at our university, how we handle, what we're trying to handle that is we created an educational technology framework for the university last year with these sort of the timeless principles. And we got that through the Learning and Teaching Committee Academic Senate, the university accepted and support that. Now we're building an educational technology plan that we want to submit by the end of June for the next two years, saying this is where the university wants to go in terms of technologies. And tied to that is a professional development and a support plan. And actually we just added a column that we might move right to the front, which is what is the pedagogical rationale for introducing that? So we get broad agreement from the university and then we can go to the, to the managers and say, right, we agreed to this, now we need resources, you know, to make this work. So I think you, you need a bit of a broad base, otherwise you get champions starting here and there and there's no way to integrate and bring it together. That's the one. The second is a more bottom-up approach, which is a community of practice. So we purposefully create more connections among academics and teaching support staff uh, in Yammer and in a, a LMS site that we called about ICT integration. We've got about 500 people in there, all voluntary. Yammer, we've got 285 voluntary. And that's where people start talking to each other. And so it's a way to get the groundswell going. And then these, this kind of opportunities for academics to talk with their peers. Because I, we, we're hearing that all the time from educational designers where academics say, show me how to do that, so how somebody else is doing it. I don't want the technicalities in a paper to read, that's fine. 
but just show me in another academic that's already experimenting with this. And we're trying to bring those stories together. Um, um, Adam, before we came, we were speaking to Philip about this. We are still champions on campus because of our bottom of the production. It's not mandatory. Like at UJ, everybody was forced to. So you have uh, faculties that are creating podcasts for reading. The rain is here. She did podcasts with her students in 2006. And then you find another academic that will say, no, I'm not interested. So you find lecturers that are doing it five years already, and they're writing articles on it. And these lecturers here using clickers for key reading activities. And these people that have 10 modules online, and somebody that will tell you, I don't want to. So we, we still have a bottom-up approach, continuous training, continuous support. But nobody's forced to do anything. So we have our champions, and the seeds are sprouting. And we have 1, 000, over 1,000 courses online. And some people are saying, I don't want to do anything. And others are saying, oh, thanks, do one with me. Go away, I'll do 10 on my own. And this is the reality that we've seen. Well, we we'll probably start seeing it as we start to tie those teaching and learning methodologies to concrete stuff like that. Um, I don't know, subsidies or something. Yes. But even an example of a drastic strategy that my previous workplace, where the entire university, and I spoke to you about the entire university, shut down for a day. No one was allowed on campus, yet you had to continue with your class. So you are forcing every class to keep running, but not to be, a, not to be on campus. And so that's obviously a more drastic <coughs> But yeah. We just wonder what you'll think to get going. Probably one of many, and, and in the sense that, you know, you, it's, hard, it's hardly possible that one strategy will work. You know, just to make a framework or a plan, well, that's great. It's a piece yeah. of paper and it's an online document. But where's the groundswell? You know, the bottom-up kind of things, and, and then interesting initiatives like, you know, shutting things down for a day and things must continue. So, how will you do it digitally and things like that. Let it all play together. Um, but the universities also make an investment in people and in technology. And you know, you can't forever go on saying that, you know, if people want to use it, they can use it if they don't want it. Could, you know, there's an investment uh, being made by the university and you want rewards of that in that investment. And I mean the rewards that you're really looking after is in learning. Yeah. Uh, it's not the technology, you know, we've got to uptake of so much, but how has it changed the learning? Is the learning better? And that's that's the difficult question. But you just wonder then, sorry, you know, one last time was but you just wonder, as a university, when we are now sitting at a point where this university is going to be, at least in the next 12 months, you see this high-speed connectivity, what are we doing strategically to prepare for that? Mm. Because we can get all that high tech stuff coming down the pipe, but if you're not ready to take hold of it and to take advantage of it, you know, we, these frameworks and stuff, you know, do we have a system in place where we'll be able to take advantage of that? Or are we going to talk about it once we get that access? Or rely on the same uh, champions. That's a good question. <laughs> Very good.